Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Overcoming Multiplayer Game Server Challenges with Amazon Web Services. Uh, my name's Ed Smith. I'm coming to you from uh, sunny and tropical Copenhagen, where the skies are gray and the rain is even rainier. So uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, by way of introduction, as I said, my name's Ed Smith. I'm an Amazon Game Tech account representative. I've got about eight years of helping gaming and other uh, technology companies and startups and you know, navigating Amazon Web Services and previously EMC before this. Uh, I'm a lifetime gamer. Uh, I can still remember the first day of mine getting my N64 and Mario N64. Long since then though, I'm now playing PUBG, lots of Hearts of Iron, Paradox games and uh, Warhammer 2. Hi guys, I'm uh, Pete Chapman. I'm a uh, specialist solutions architect uh, for gaming. Um, I work in the Amazon Game Tech team uh, and I'm coming to you from uh, not so sunny UK at the moment. Um, I've got about 13 or so years of software development experience and uh, architecture design experience. And I've worked in a varied um, range of industries from retail, healthcare, and you know, crucially gaming. That's something I've been focusing on a lot in the uh, most recent years. I'm also an avid gamer, have been my whole life. Um, my first console was an NES, so uh, that probably ages me a little bit. Um, and I'm currently replaying Shenmue on the uh, Xbox and playing the, uh, the new HD remake. So I'm playing that first, and I'm going to do Shenmue 2 after I've done that. Anyway, really excited to talk to you guys, and um, we'll, uh, we'll get into it. So before we get into what we're going to cover today, I um, just want to introduce what we're doing within Amazon Game Tech uh, here at AWS. Uh, and as you can kind of see from the from the kind of um, the, the the image here, we're actually covering quite a lot these days. Um, we've kind of got the AWS core services in which we're kind of like helping out with um, infrastructure services for games, and you know people like myself and Ed come and help you make the most of AWS for your game. Actually, we're going to focus on this area a lot today. But then we also have uh, Twitch, uh, which is a very popular, as you probably know, game streaming service, and where we're coming to to you from uh, today, uh, and also other services like Alexa. Um, Amazon GameSparks and, and of course, uh, Lumberyard as well, our AAA game engine. So I'm going to throw it over to Ed to introduce the agenda. Awesome. Thanks, Pete. So uh, just a quick one, run through. So what we're going to talk about today is, you know, why you would run your multiplayer game in the cloud, uh, discuss some of the major infrastructure challenges and options for solving them with AWS with a few customer examples that we have kind of littered throughout. Um, and review AWS customer infrastructure to run their multiplayer games. As we're going through, uh, I'd just like to say one thing that if you guys have any questions or comments that you'd like to uh, ask us, um, we'll save those for the end, but you know, feel free to throw them in the chat uh, so that way we have them kind of logged up. So cool, so let's run through the next thing here. So um, why would you use the cloud for multiplayer games, right? So you might run it, you might use it because you want to run larger game sessions, you need to perform some uh, complex simulation on servers, uh, you might have, need improved latency. Uh, obviously, it's always important to have your, uh, you know, your end users and your gamers have a low latency experience. Um, you might want to remain somewhat platform agnostic. Um, so who are some of your, you know, colleagues out there who have really done this. Uh, a great example is For Honor. So For Honor first came out as a uh, peer-to-peer multiplayer game. It's a, it's a hacker and a slasher. Um, and you know, peer-to-peer -peer seems like a great solution for most of our customers out there. It seems very cost-effective, right? You don't really have to set up any infrastructure on the back end for it. You can just kind of let all the individual players utilize you know their, their basically their home pcs to be the host um, however there's a lot of challenges that come with that if you're going to make a competitive multiplayer game um, you need a low latency experience you need to make sure that you're mitigating the amount of cheating that might happen within that game because that's really going to kill any game um, so you really when ubisoft kind of reevaluated whether or not they wanted to stick with play to peer to peer they found that they were having some, facing some of these challenges around latency. Um, they'd have some issues with kind of resyncs, desyncs. Um, you know, there might be an instance where somebody is playing the game and you know, something pops up and that person has to leave. And if that person's the host, 
that can interrupt the experience for everyone else. Um, so, uh, you know, Ubisoft uh, decided instead that they wanted to move towards dedicated game instances and towards uh, game lift. So for that, um, you know, the results for them were really quite striking. Uh, they were able to improve their player base. We can even see, um, you know, there was, I remember seeing on Reddit that day some, some, uh, some comments about how big the difference was. There it is. There's that, there's that comment. Um, the results were happier players. There were no resyncs, you know, no session host migrations, um, and no weakest link kind of impact, which is to say that, you know, when somebody has a, a you know, not so great internet connection, it's not going to negatively impact, you know, those people around. Um, so it, it ended up being a great solution for some of our customers. Um, and they recently actually allowed and got it uh, left it out there for uh, as, a, as a free weekend. I actually picked it up on Steam at that point where if you download it then you can kind of play it for free forever. We saw their, their number of concurrent users jump up significantly. And thanks to AWS, they were able to kind of scale to meet that. Now, while we're on the topic of scaling, you know, Pete, maybe you can run us through some of the major challenges that you've seen our customers dealing with building multiplayer games. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, happy to. So, um, I think definitely there's there's kind of three main areas when it comes to uh, key challenges when when building multiplayer games, and the first one is like um, Ubisoft found with For Honor scaling, uh, be it you know you've got a big game and you want to run on peer to peer and and you're struggling to do that, or crucially if you want to essentially automatically scale um, to meet your player demand and kind of essentially reduce the waste of of running running servers that, that that do idle over times because players aren't necessarily you know, accessing the game all, you know, all throughout the day. So scaling is definitely one of those big challenges. And I think that um, that's something that we we have several options within AWS that we can we can explore today and, and, and see how we can kind of help that. The other one is authentication. Um, and authentication is one of those challenges that it, it really needs to be, it's actually a critical path piece of your, um, you know, getting players into a game. It also has to scale based on player demand because every single player is going to play your game. You're going to want to authenticate them, obviously. Um, and so uh, that needs to be resilient, needs to be running all the time, highly available. Um, but, but it's one of those things that really doesn't actually add anything to your game. It's something you have to have and all games need to run properly and well for their players. Um, but it but it really doesn't add anything kind of cool to the game. So um, if you can spend a little, as little amount of time as possible kind of managing and maintaining that, that's, that's a good place to be. So we'll look into that too. And then, um, then thirdly, uh, matchmaking. Matchmaking kind of has three facets. One being the accuracy of the matchmaker, which, which you can control by your, your uh, matchmaking rules. And that's, that's a really crucial one. But there's another two aspects that you, you know, you kind of, again, don't really add to the, to the gameplay experience. Um, and they would be the speed of the matchmaker. And of course, again, it's, it's, it's uptime and resilience, um, it's kind of scalability. So those two elements, those last two elements are, again, pieces that you have to have and you want, but you don't necessarily want to build and, and ultimately manage at the, at the detail level. So, um, so and there are obviously things that could be the harder parts to, to kind of build out too. So we're gonna take a look at that as well. And um, before we get into all of that and kind of look at the individual specific um, uh, elements of the challenges, um, we're going to take a quick look at global reach and how you can scale your game around the world. Um, and um, with at the moment, there are actually currently 16, uh, 19, sorry, AWS regions available throughout the world um, with four um, uh, coming sh uh, sh soon. And Ultimately, what you can do with that is you can take a couple of approaches. You know, you've got the option to make use of just a few of those regions. Let's say your game is targeted at just a, just a small geo, or you know, like so let's say for example, just one part of the world. Um, you could just pick a few regions that are going to support your player base, um, and that's really handy because you don't have to go global and you don't have to sort of you know put it anywhere you don't want to. But you can just focus on a particular area, even just one or two regions. Um, but let's say equally, if your game is completely global and you're going to be targeting everybody around the world, you could actually almost as easily just make use of all AWS regions that are currently available and go to the new ones when they when they do come out and get to some of those new market areas that you couldn't previously. Uh, and that's critical because that can really help you um, balance out and create low latency experiences for your for your players. And, and again, you've got that resilience through through many different locations around the world. 
And again, that, that really results in um, a lower latency experience for your players when connecting. Uh, if we take a look at some some kind of uh, aggregated data that we've got around you know play and how players are in, uh, engaging uh, games in terms of latency with our regions um, we find that if developers really put you know a game in just a one region the latency can be you know somewhat high really um, i mean if you're building say a twitchy fps shooter or something like that um, you probably want a lower latency than than we see there at that kind of average um, with one region um, but to, to kind of, it's very quite, you know, it's really very, very uh, relatively easy to pull that down by making use of more AWS regions and you can kind of get that, that latency reduced through, through doing that. So Ed, um, why don't you, you know, talk us through the first challenge a little bit and, you know, let's explore scaling. Absolutely. You know, as I mentioned, obviously Ubisoft is a great example, but another great example that I like to see in this is actually uh, Epic's Fortnite, which I think at this point in time has somewhere around, uh, I think 125 million concurrent yeah. users. Um, and they're utilizing AWS for all of their game server needs. Um, so what you're seeing in this current slide right now, uh, particularly in that graph is kind of the traditional way that games companies and you know most traditional industries would utilize IT. That red line would represent kind of your fixed capacity, whereas that yellow line would represent you know the actual number of players you have. So uh, as you see, there are moments in the, during the day where you know it's late at night, you know people aren't awake. So there's really those those servers that you have on the red line really aren't being utilized. And then conversely, as you get later into the day, people are getting back from work, kids are getting back from school, people are gonna start gaming a lot more and you'll see a spike in the day. Um, in both instances, neither one is necessarily ideal. Um, where you have more servers than there are demand, that's time spent uh, or time and money spent that's, that's not wasted. You know, you're, you're not really utilizing those things. You're not utilizing that capacity. You've overspent. Um, in those instances where the player demand is higher than the number of servers, you get the opposite effect where your players are going to be sitting there. They're going to be waiting to get into games. They're going to be having a, you know, maybe a high latency experience. Uh, and ultimately, that's not going to be good for your, your players. It's not going to be good for your game. So what is more ideal and what is something that we see, like, like I said, from the likes of, say, Fortnite and uh, Supercell Clash Royale, is that they move towards a cloud utilization where, you know, the number of servers more closely and tightly aligns to that yellow line. So when the peaks are at their absolute highest, they're scaling up to meet that demand. And conversely, as it gets later into the night, and they can't utilize, they, there's nobody really utilizing the servers within say North America, the, uh, the servers will start to spin down. Granted with a global game like Fortnite, um, you know, there, that means the servers are going to be spinning up somewhere else, say in uh, you know, Japan or maybe somewhere in Europe. But ultimately the values you're gonna see from this, um, from making this changes, you're no longer going to have to predict your global demand. It's very difficult to figure out precisely how popular your game is going to be. I mean, PUBG and Fortnite are great examples. They're both companies that kind of became an overnight success and all of a sudden millions of concurrent players. Um, the other aspect to that is, you know, the cost for available capacity needed at peak times. If you're spending all the, all the money and capital, if you're spending a bunch of capital on servers at the peak time, you know, that's only for maybe a few hours during the day, and that's a lot of time wasted, um, and a lot of money that's also wasted. So let's look through some of the methods that you could use for scaling your game. So obviously, if you, you, if you, as you see here, there's a few things that you could do. So for example, uh, you know, session-based games, such as, you know, like I said, your Clash Royale, you can utilize, uh, you know, game lift. Um, you can also utilize Game Sparks. This also applies to the turn-based and lightweight real time. To touch on these briefly, Game Lift is a fully managed infrastructure service. So all you really need to do is push your game code into Game Lift, and we'll take care of the infrastructure on the back end for you, utilizing all of our best practices. You spin up, you spin down, just all based on player demand. This is something you'll see actually from For Honor and what they're using today. Um, game Sparks very similar. Um, and the great part about both of these, 
uh, they're fully managed and you can also utilize uh, their, our own built, uh, custom built matchmaking solutions, which we'll go into some of the matchmaking later, but uh, matchmaking is obviously another difficult challenge that, uh, that needs to be overcome as much as possible. Uh, persistent worlds, you might want to utilize you know, something a little bit more uh, traditional with EC2 and a Amazon's uh, EC2 auto scaling. Um, you might also want to utilize our container services, which is a fully managed container service and some, similar to something you'd see within you know, Docker containers. Um, so that's just a handful of some of the solutions that can be utilized for automatically scaling up and down. You have the option to kind of utilize something that's fully managed by us or something that's a little bit more customizable for you guys where you can really kind of tweak and manage it yourselves. It all depends on what you'd like to do. Um, but yeah, that's just a, a brief overview of the scaling. Maybe we can uh, just, go just, into um, authentication throw, next. Sorry, I just got to throw one oh. quick distinction in there. Um, yeah. I just throw in that um, the, the kind of big difference between GameLift and GameSparks is GameLift is really aiming to um to run your dedicated game server so um yep. if you've got something that's going to run a full simulation of the game or something like that um game lift is definitely the, the really you know the very best starting point for that and if you've got something mm -hmm. super lightweight that you just need to kind of do maybe more of a packet switching approach maybe it's turn-based or like i say re uh, lightweight real time uh, game sparks is definitely the starting point there. and that, that kind of just distinguishes those two fully managed managed services i'd say good point sorry about that i don't think i was very clear <laughs> but Anyway, thank you. Uh, I think uh, next one's authentication. I'll let you take this one. Yeah, cheers, Ed. So um, with authentication, it's one of those things, as I touched on earlier, um, it's one of those challenges. And it's one of those things you, you, know, you need to do, games need, um, but you don't necessarily want to have to kind of build it every single time. Um, uh, or, or essentially um, kind of manage all of the, the kind of tasks and operational overhead that comes with that. Um, and, and why? authentication matters is that essentially it's the, the front door, it's the front gate to your game. Uh, every interaction that your game client is going to make with your with your um, back end should first be authentic, authenticated even, you know, even if you kind of keep a token for a period of time, you, you definitely want your place to be authenticated um, as a starting point. And you're going to want to do that before you do anything else. You, you don't want to you know, waste any cycles processing something that essentially you're going to throw away. And of course, if there's somebody mani uh, maliciously attacking your system, you don't want them uh, to be able to kind of have an influence, uh, you know, as, have as minimal influence on your cycles as possible. So you want to throw that away and know that they're not, they're not good before you've done anything else. So, so it's quite an important task. And as I said before, it really does need to scale with demand um, and it needs to be highly, highly resilient for, for those reasons. Equally, um, you're probably going to be looking at your player data in some way, shape, or form when you're authenticating. And so, uh, you, you, in, you know, it's depending on what data you're storing on your player, you might have to think about things like um, uh, data sovereignty and, and things like that as well. There's as another challenge uh, that, that comes with authentication. As I mentioned, scalability is a, a challenge here because it is part of the player's critical path. Um, and another challenge you have with authentication is you know, potentially integration with third parties that um, that really uh, allow you to do things like social login. Uh, and if you want one or two or three or four of those types of integrations in your in your logon process, um, building it yourself means you, you're going to have to build the integration and the plumbing to those third parties. Um, so that's that's another challenge and, and something to bear in mind. And then uh, finally, well, in the last couple here, we're we're kind of talking really about. Um, managing your own player data store. Um, you might want to do this and you maybe already do do this, um, but that does come with it um, some operational overhead and again maybe concerns around or thoughts around data sovereignty, things like that. So they're just things to bear in mind and, and challenges that come with managing your authentication flow. So to help with some of these things, we actually do have um, a certain, several options in AWS that, that can kind of fit certain scenarios. Um, and starting at the top here, um, the, I suppose the quickest and easiest solution to this is to um, take a look at GameSparks. GameSparks actually has within it um, authentications already out of the box, uh, like you know, with third parties um, integrated. So for example, you could authenticate against Xbox Live, PlayStation Network, Nintendo, um, and also on the social side, um, things like Amazon, Google, um, Twitch, you know, systems like that um, to actually uh, manage the authentication process and essentially delegate that to those third parties. 
Um, and once you've done that, um, you, we, GameSpots can actually manage your player context for you as well. And it can also act as a player data store. Um, and Ed, you know, described GameSpots really well before, so I won't go into any more detail about it here, but definitely worth looking at it, you know, from a perspective of helping to manage your authentication path and really making that those integrations with third parties more of a kind of configuration than a development task. Um, if you're in though, the, the situation where potentially you've already got your own player data store somewhere or you already authorize your players in a certain way or mechanism, some of our customers have fairly um, mature systems that uh, you know, have like you know, back end player data. Um, they have systems where they kind of have a massive pool of player information and really they don't want to migrate that at this point or you know, they, they have a particular set of um, processes in place that they, they use to, to authorize. Um, but they maybe want to put that into a location that is more, you know, cloud centric or um, you know, hosted uh, in a managed way. Well, one option for that is to make use of Amazon API Gateway as a front door to this. Um, so for, for those who, who haven't come across API, API Gateway yet, um, that essentially allows you to create HTTPS endpoints um, of your own design and then um, perform tasks in the AWS ecosystem as a result of receiving a request. And so you can actually create what we call a custom authorizer here using AWS Lambda, our, um, our functional compute capability, um, to go off and actually authenticate in the way that you, that you want to, and you know, maybe you already do in some ways. Certainly you can check your own player data stores and things like that. Um, but the benefit you get here is you essentially put that into a managed framework as well, um, you know, minimizing your operational overhead. So that's definitely worth taking a look at for, for those who have got that kind of setup. And then finally, for those out there who are maybe not sort of looking at using GameSparks for um, many different things, because actually GameSparks provides a suite of many features, um, and you don't already have a, a back-end player data store that you want to you know, make use of, um, or if you're actually using HTTP instead of WebSockets, so GameSparks uses WebSockets just for, for a bit of information there, um, you could also make use of API Gateway plus Amazon Cognito. And Cognito is essentially a, um, a mobile authentic authentication service that allows you to, to store player data as well. So you could use that as your player data repository, store your own information in there about that, and then have that fronted by Amazon API Gateway to perform, you know, the combination of the two will perform the authentication with. So, so that's a little look at the options available with um, with authentication. Um, and now uh, we're going to take a take a spin through matchmaking. So I'll pass it over to Ed again to to lead us in there. Thanks, Pete. Um, so matchmaking is something that I know is uh, a challenge for a lot of our customers, and it's an important one, right? Um, I, I like to play a lot of multiplayer games myself, and I think most of the people probably here have do like to play multiplayer games themselves. Um, and we've all been in those instances where you're playing and you're maybe playing against somebody who is significantly better than you, or maybe, you know, your team versus their team. It's just a mismatch in skill set. And that's just never a fun experience. Um, whether you're the ones absolutely winning or the ones absolutely losing, though I'll be honest, I, I don't mind absolutely crushing the other team that much. It's kind of, <laughs> it can be fun <laughs> from time to time, but it's a bad experience um, in the long run. And more often and more importantly, you also don't want to sit, have your players sitting around waiting too long for a match. If they're sitting there waiting forever, you know, the, they've got Steam there, they've got, you know, their, their Xbox is sitting in front of it. You know, they might just get exit out and uh, and start playing something else. Um, and, and who knows if they'll come back and, you know, player retention is obviously very important. So we understand matchmaking is very difficult because one, you want to make sure the matches are competitive. Two, you want to make sure that they have a low latency experience, but you also want to make sure that as the customer as, or as the, uh, the, the player is kind of looking around and searching through their, their player pool, um, you might need to expand that reach throughout. So um, what are some ways that customers are dealing with this challenge today? Um, well, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, there's the kind of session-based games, which GameLift is great for. We have FlexMatch in there. Uh, so that is kind of our own managed solution for matchmaking. But it has some customization ability and the ability to change some dials. And you might have you know, some kind of drop-in, drop-out features and functionality. This might be good for a game where, say, you know, there's a persistent kind of world on top 
with, uh, you know, individual matches happening, you know, kind of on the ground. So maybe it's a, a giant war type scenario and individual matches are constantly happening. And while they fight it out, at the end of the day, the, cal the scores are calculated and it shifts the war. Um, those people might be dropping in and out all the time. So flex match is going to be able to do that for you while also, you know, matching players based on skill. Maybe that's an ELO score that you guys have. Um, maybe it's based on geolocation as well and latency. So you can kind of tweak those knobs and hone that into something that really makes the most sense for your game and the most sense for your player base. Uh, GameSpark, similarly, it's uh, great for like, you know, like Pete said, kind of those lightweight uh, turn-based games that are kind of player to player and uses simple skills-based, you know, P2P sort of matchmaker. Um, there's flexible and customizable with seven core languages. There's the, with AWS Lambda. Now, I'm admittedly not the most technical person in the world. So, uh, Pete, maybe you can expand a little bit on the AWS Lambda piece um, before we move on. Yeah, sure. This is kind of a good situation. This is good for like customers who um, maybe already have a matchmaker. So they maybe already have some, uh, you know, fair bit of time invested in uh, a matchmaking process that they've written in a, a language um, such as Python or Go or something like that. And um, essentially, they, they don't really want to migrate fully away from that. Uh, they're perhaps running that on-prem or in a colo facility or something like that. But essentially, they, they would like to turn that into something more managed, something that they don't have to, to manage uh, as, as intensely uh, at the server level. Um, Lambda is a great way to kind of uh, think about that, maybe maybe investigate for, for those kinds of situations. Because you, what you could do is you could take, um, again, if it's written in the same language that, that Lambda supports, you could take that code, um, tweak it, post it in Lambda, run it in Lambda. And the beauty of that is that essentially at that point, you can really don't have to worry about servers. It's, it's one of our serverless technologies. Um, and it will scale automatically up and down based on request. Uh, and and matchmaking is a really good fit for Lambda because uh, Lambda kind of wants to do the job for you quickly and be done. And you want matchmaking processes to be run quickly and be done. So they're kind of they're, they're kind of a really good good fit for each other. Equally equally with Lambda, you can still access other sort of data stores. So if you've got a process where you're storing some data in a database as part of the matchmaking process, which you probably do, um, you can still access those, assuming it's you know accessible from the locations you're running your function in. Um, so definitely that's worth taking a look at. And then, I mean, I'll just finish off. I mean, finally, with lift and shift um, uh, here as well. Uh, this is for customers who are interested in, you know, migrating to the cloud. And, and ultimately, they've got maybe a matchmaking process that's running as an ex executable on a server. Again, could be colo, could be in a, um, their own uh, on their own tin. Um, potentially, that maybe is going end of life, and they've got to do something about that, and either look at reinvesting in hardware or or maybe putting it somewhere else in the cloud, maybe. And for those use cases where you don't have the time or the inclination um, to modify and, and you know, redevelop to any degree your, um, your existing matchmaking process, you certainly have the option of taking it and putting it into a, an Amazon EC2 um, virtual machine uh, setup, or, or of course our container services as well. Um, so for those who just want to lift and shift and get it over, that's definitely an option. So I think at this point, you know, we've kind of talked about all the main challenges and we've really started to explore some of the possibilities. And I guess it's worth kind of calling out that really there is no game type that you, you can't host within AWS. So um, I'll, I'll pass it over to Ed maybe to kind of talk about some of the, the, the differences and, and the kind of benefits of each approach of managing and building yeah. your own. Cool, thanks. Um, so I, I, I think what, what can be said as well is, um, as you just mentioned, I mean, you can host any game here, whether it be an RTS, an FPS, it can be a MOBA, um, whatever it may be, um, we have plenty of examples of, of customers who are using, you know, precisely those kind of uh, our services, many of the ones that we mentioned today, you know, for their games, whether they be mobile, such as, you know, Rovio and Supercell with Angry Birds and Clash of Clans, first person shooters with the likes of, uh, you know, PUBG and with, uh, you know, uh, Fortnite, and then we've got you know, plenty of other uh, mobile MOBA examples with like Loot Riot's League of Legends. So, you know, whatever it is you're looking to run, you know, we're here, we're here to kind of help you guys out and help you through it. Um, and whether that be managed services, right? You want something quick, you want something fast. You don't want to really put in a lot of time and effort yourself. You may not necessarily have 
um, the the develop the uh, the technical people on on hand to to build something out. You might be just a couple of guys in a in a garage and building a, a game that you find fun on on Unity or something, and you just want uh, some some back end infrastructure to help you out. Um, this really is a good way to kind of take away some of that undifferentiated heavy lifting. Um, from the game and and let us kind of help you take care of that and you guys can just focus on making a really fun player experience um, Conversely you, you can build your own uh, There are plenty of customers out there that I see who have been around for a long time Game companies that have built their own back-end services that built their own matchmaker um, Whatever the case may be they've built something that's really special for them something uniquely tailored to fit their needs That's fine, you know and that still works really well with Amazon EC2, with you know, the container services, Lambda and API Gateway, Cognito, whatever the services may be. Um, we touched on a few of them here today, but there's there's so many more that you can utilize um, to really bring your game to life and make sure that your players have an absolutely splendid experience working and playing with your game. So uh, whatever you choose, you know you can you can rely on. Uh, getting something that's reliable, scalable, and cost-effective, uh, something that you've seen, again, with that ability to kind of scale up and scale down as needed where your demand comes along, um, and something that's reliable, something that's used by you know, most of the top 50 games out there. I think it's 90% of the top 50 uh, games out there and games companies are actually utilizing AWS in some capacity. Um, to that end, to really kind of demonstrate the reliability, scalability, and cost effectiveness of AWS, um, Pete, maybe you can share with us a little bit about how Super Mega Baseball 2 uh, utilized AWS for their game. Sure, yeah, this is the, uh, the fun part for me. I get to talk through an architecture. <laughs> Something I always like doing. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, as Ed said, um, we've uh, one good example of uh, a design um, uh, using. Uh, some of our services to host a, a really cool game was uh, Metalhead uh, for Super Mega Baseball 2. And Metalhead, just to kind of give a bit of context, had some really specific requirements about their game and how it needed to operate in the cloud. Um, firstly, they first and foremost, actually, they wanted to make sure the game was um, cross-platform. So they wanted to be able to support you know, PCs playing against Xboxes and basically open it up to as many platforms as they could to play each other uh, in multiplayer. So, so that was definitely one thing. And the architecture that they, they wanted to design had to really support, support all of those um, and the ability to match make um, those together. And in fact, um, we do have a separate um, uh, uh, webinar out there that talks specifically about that with uh, Metalhead. Definitely recommend looking at that if you're interested in how you can use matchmaking to support cross-platform play. Um, and uh, the other requirements they had though was of course global scale. They, they were deploying this game globally, they were launching it globally, um, and they, they really wanted to make sure that that game, um, their game scaled wherever the players were and on, on demand based on where the players were kind of awake, playing or, you know, or not. Uh, scaling up and down uh, globally was absolutely crucial. And then the final requirement that they had was latency. Um, I don't know for those who've taken a look and played the game, but um, it's it's actually quite a fast-paced game. Um, a pitcher can pitch a ball to the to the batter, um, and a, a hundred mile an hour fastball can can get from uh, the mount to the plate in about I think 0.4 seconds. So being able to react to that, um, you know, from a player's perspective and actually hit the ball and have that accurate um, would would obviously needed a very low latency um, uh, experience. So that was crucial too. So to meet all these requirements, um, uh, Metalhead you know, built an architecture just like this at a high level. Essentially, they have their game clients um, calling into Amazon API Gateway. And the first thing they're doing is authenticating, play, logging in the player and authenticating the player. Um, and this is obviously only represented on this diagram by one line just to keep it clean. But from there, after that authentication has take, taken place, subsequent requests are made using uh, a token that's shared. And essentially, they can, um, they can do things like um, request sessions uh, and check up on the session request too. So those are also going via Amazon API Gateway. Once it gets those requests, it will forward them on to um, AWS Lambda. And the first thing Lambda does is it persists the matchmaking uh, data. So that's useful for a couple of things. Firstly, it's useful for making sure that if something goes wrong with the process, we've, we've got a state. We know exactly that we've captured that request and, and we know where it is. So we can, we can replay from there. 
But secondly, um, any sort of checks that the game clients need to make about where the matchmaking process is and what state it's in can go straight to the DynamoDB database rather than keep talking to, say, GameLift or something like that in the back end, uh, which can you know, certainly make things a lot quicker for the, for the game client to, to get a response for. Um, anyway, once it's persisted the data, the Lambda function uh, will then go off and uh, call Amazon Game with Flex Match and request a match on behalf of the player. Um, so that will uh, Flex Match will look at the rules that have been defined by by Metalhead. Um, and so let's say, for example, they're matching based on skill or the or the player's kind of response speed, that kind of thing, or what kind of level they're at. Um, it will find the match for the for the player, and then. Hello, sorry about that. For some reason, I've uh, I've gone on mute there. So apologies for that. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, guys. Um, so yeah, once that um, that match has been found and uh, we've we found a server, the server IP address and port is passed back to the matchmaker. And once it has that, it will call Amazon Simple Notification Service, which is our um, um, uh, push notification service, and that will trigger a Lambda function directly. And that Lambda function will then persist the state of the matchmaking um, ticket for this particular player. So it will say, yes, I found a match. And it will also uh, save the IP address and port for the, for the game session. So we, I mentioned earlier, the game client will just be checking in with the um, Amazon API gateway um, endpoint to say, hey, is my session ready? Can I, can I start playing? Uh, at this point, it will check and, and it will find, yes, you know, you've got a match. Here's your uh, IP address and port. Uh, and you know, now you can go and connect to it. So the game client can then connect directly in to the, the game server itself. That means that API gateway, game lift, everything else gets completely out of the way and the session happens just between client and server as, as you'd want you know, to, to, to minimize any latency overhead. And so that's kind of how the game session takes place. The, the final thing that can happen, and I've, I've got it articulated on here and, and, and uh, Metalhead do use this, is when a session is completed or, or, or during the course of it, you can talk to other parts of, of AWS or other systems from your server. And in this case, you know, maybe updating session results or player skill updates can take place at the end of the session uh, and persist to DynamoDB or any other services that you, that you want or, service, or, or systems outside of, of AWS if you should choose. Um, once the session is finished, all of the players leave, obviously, and GameLift will see that that session is done, uh, and then it will basically recycle it and give it to other players to, to use. Or if, or if no more demand is being requested from players, eventually it will, it will, it will shut down the servers and, of course, start saving, saving you money. So that's just a quick run through of how Super Mega Baseball 2 and Metalhead managed to, um, to you know, build out a global um, architecture for their game, you know, with, which ultimately provided a sort of 41 millisecond uh, global median latency, which is, which is pretty cool stuff. So with that, um, that's, uh, we've kind of reached the end of the uh, the content that we want to talk to to you guys today. So um, we'll open it at this point for any questions that you have. Awesome. So uh, Pete, I did see a couple of questions kind of pop up while we were while we were talking uh, that I don't see uh, having been addressed. So perhaps we can kind of start off with some of those. Cool. Um, so the first one I'm seeing here is, uh, it looks like Jay Kingpin was following off of uh, Tamarator 2, which was essentially a question around, um, you're creating a real-time first-person shooter game, and you know there's two scenarios, which is, one, you've got a small team of just four developers, and then the other scenario is you've got a very massively experienced team of veterans, and you've got um, you know, how they can customize, they can build their own. What do you recommend, right? So um, I would say for the scenario, for either scenario, what's great is you, you really have choice. Um, for the scenario where it's a small team, you know, it may be better to go with game lift because with game lift, you're just taking the code that you, you know, you, your devs have made and kind of pushing it in and we manage kind of the back end for you. Um, so that might be better. I think that's probably going to be the better one in that scenario. 
but you can also do the same thing that you might do in the second scenario, which is if these guys are veterans and they really want to kind of build their own, they really want to customize it, they want to tweak it, you know, they can do that too. Um, if, if they so wish. Uh, so in scenario two, where there's the, you know, IT sort of veterans go in there. Um, we actually have a really great white paper, which Pete, I think, I think you might've had some input in that one directly, um, <laughs> that actually outlines precisely how you, uh, how you would actually build that out, um, from, from a uh, low latency, uh, and highly durable and reliable, um, infrastructure. I can actually maybe look that white paper up and put that a link to that in the chat. Um, while we go through to the next question, um, yeah. which it looks like came from. Um, just, I'll just add one quick thing to that question yeah. though, before we move on. Um, yeah, one one scenario I have seen is that even with those big companies, sometimes they still look to the managed services. And, and the reason for that is that. Um, yeah, great point. Actually great can, point. Well, they can, they can actually reuse those those talents that those really experienced network developers or engineers have to like, absolutely hone the networking stack in their game from client to server and, you know, basically minimize the amount of bandwidth to the to the nth degree or, you know, figure out compression or do interpolation, whatever it is that they're doing, they can use those skills to focus like almost 100% on that and then kind of worry less about the actual building of the infrastructure and managing it. Um, and I think also the engineers that I've, I've come across in those organizations have probably enjoyed that more as well because they're dealing with the hard challenges that are all about making the actual game super performant and not so much the kind of challenges that they have to do for every single game. It's a great point. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to look up some of that, that, that white paper that we have, uh, in the interim, I think the next question I'm seeing here is from, uh, uh, Roberto. Uh, I, Bergo Dorte, please, uh, please apologize. My apologies if I, uh, if I messed that one up. Um, and he asked, are there any managed services for low latency UDP communication? So Pete, do you want to take that one? Yeah, so uh, we don't have anything within the AWS suite of services that kind of like focus 100% on low latency UDP communication. Um, so essentially the way that, for example, with GameLift, which is probably where you're going to be interacting with a client server on a, on, on a low latency or on a UDP connection, um, ultimately GameLift is really trying to keep out the way of that at this point. So what it's trying to do is it's just literally trying to make sure your session's running, your game servers are managed and everything's running smoothly. Um, but when it comes to client server interaction, it, it, it doesn't want to add any latency. So it doesn't, it doesn't kind of get it, get in the way. Um, uh, Amazon uh, Lumbyard does have a networking stack that, that kind of helps with that, but that's kind of part of the, the engine itself. Um, so uh, it's not something you, we kind of, you know, have separately uh, at the moment. But um, one thing we can do is, you know, if, if you're kind of working with Amazon and, and working with us as solutions architects, we can always um, help you in terms of what the, the strategy is you're, you know, you're using to kind of build out your networking stack. And also we can help um, by introducing you to some other uh, customers who have solved some of these challenges, um, be it either anonymously in some cases, or even if we kind of, you know, can do an introduction and we can kind of help that conversation happen so you can kind of share the experience as well directly. So those are just a kind of couple of ways we can help with that with that challenge. Great. And in the interim, I actually just put into the chat uh, the a couple of white papers. Uh, one is around optimizing multiplayer game server performance, and the other is around scalable gaming patterns. Um, so I think between both of those, you should be able to uh, really learn quite a bit around how to set up your own infrastructure, set up on EC2, uh, you know, auto scaling, load balancers, and all the like um, to make that 100 man battle with a highly veteran team. Cool. So let's look here and see if there are any other uh, questions that we, uh, that we may have missed. Um, comment on similarities and differences between AWS and Steam. Um, that one's an interesting one. So um, I, I would say that uh, you know AWS, we're, we're an infrastructure backend service. Steam is also kind of a retail. Um, 
Pete, you might know a little bit more around this one yourself. Anything that you'd like to comment on or? Yeah, I'd say the, the first thing is that we're essentially, um, we're kind of agnostic of, um, of any individual organic gaming platform. So what we're, what we're looking to do is help you connect to those kinds of services um, and make use of, uh, make use of them to enrich your player experience. So um, for example, so calling out to Steam and maybe doing authentication or getting friends list from there is something uh, GameSparks can help you with. Equally, though, it can do things like uh, help you with PSN and Xbox connections too. So we're really in that um, in that position where what we're we're aiming to do is help you build out your infrastructure and architecture, regardless of kind of platform provider, and actually enable you to build ideally one architecture actually that, that can sustain and su support all of them and interact with all of them reducing your your overhead in operations management development maintenance all of those kinds of things um and so yeah i think that's really kind of what we're doing and obviously steam are, um are kind of you know doing doing their thing you know in terms of kind of managing um matchmaking and things like that too so um yeah i think you know the, the, that's kind of the main differences i think cool so Mr. Squarepeg asked, will the network improvements from New World make it back to Lumberyard? Um, so I think this is a good question. Um, if, I'm, if I'm being frank, um, I don't know the precise roadmap for Lumberyard. Um, and I think that's something that you know, we, we could maybe take as a follow-up afterwards. But just as a, something that's part of our ethos uh, within Amazon is you know, we kind of derive our roadmap and our solutions from our customers' recommendations and from the things that they request. So 90 to, I think it's 90% of our entire roadmap is driven by what customers want and what customers ask for. So if this is something that you've really seen and something you're asking for and you really want us to kind of make some improvements around it, you know, let us know. Um, I think just by the virtue of you asking this question, I think that that is you kind of putting in a vote or a request for it. So it's something we'll definitely take into consideration. But um, I think the lessons that we're gonna learn from building out uh, you know, our own gaming studios and our own game, game designs and game development, we're gonna democratize all of that and bring that back to you guys. So that's, uh, and Pete, is there anything you'd like to add on that one? No, I, I, th I think so. At the moment, I'm not um, also uh, aware of exactly that particular item and where it might sit on the roadmap, but I completely agree with, with your view and um, I also see it very much that way. That, that's We're definitely driven by custom demand on those things. So, yeah, I, I definitely agree. Cool. Uh, and Maverick87 Shaka asked, I'm also interested in the Lumberyard MMO native support, like scaling with meshing instead of separate instances. Pete, that one might be a little bit more for you. <laughs> yeah, so um, absolutely. So yeah, that's that's definitely um, uh, something we hear customers ask for a lot, and um, it's something that um, you know in the cloud space you can you can see definite benefits and advantages for um, being able to kind of you know, have mesh servers running in the cloud um, and just essentially host potentially infinite worlds um, as a result of that. Um, that is something we've, um, like I say, had lots of customer requests for. And um, as, as Ed just said before, we, we kind of drive a lot of our roadmap on, on customer requests. Um, so um, we don't have anything in that space right here and right now, um, but, uh, but that is something we've definitely, um, definitely hearing a lot about from customers. So um, do, uh, do, do keep in touch with us on that and we'll, we can keep talking to you about, about your needs there. Awesome. Great. Um, so unless there are any other questions, uh, what I, I think we have on the next slide, uh, an announcement on our next upcoming event. I'm getting some very bad latency here <laughs> on my side. So um, I, I know it's just improving your, your game with scalable and flexible analytic architectures on AWS is the title of it. It's going to be on Thursday, September 27th. It's going to be at 10 a.m. Pacific time. So um, register today um, and register as soon as you can. And let's see here, I believe we have a, a link. Let me get that over here. Perfect. There we go. Um, so uh, please do register and please do join us again. If there are no other questions, uh, Pete and I will hang out on, on, uh, on here for a bit. Um, but otherwise, yeah, that concludes today's uh, presentation. Thank you all very much for joining us. Thanks, guys.